Lord, we are your people gathered in your presence in order to bring praise, worship, thanksgiving to you. We thank you for the way that you have worked in our lives and are working in our lives. Lord, I thank you for those who right now are uh, eagerly anticipating Christmas. They're excited about it. They're flying high. I pray for those, Lord, who are uh, dreading this next week, a few days, and wondering how they're going to get things done or how things are going to go with family members. Or um, I know for us, uh, will Jen and Owen be able to get out of the hospital in time? Or there's, there's a lot going on in a lot of lives here, and we know that you know about all of it, that you are sovereign over all of it, and that your plans, your purposes will be fulfilled. So we pray, Lord, that you would help us as your people to walk in obedience and humility with you. Pray that you would help us to walk in your spirit, to be uh, walking in step with you. As we come to your word this morning, Lord, we ask that uh, you would be speaking to us through it, that you would help us to understand these ancient words, how they apply to our lives today, that we would be taking the encouragement and the challenge that you have for us and uh, bringing those into our lives. We thank you for the gift of your word and uh, all of its complexity, all of its beauty. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm excited to share with you guys today from Isaiah chapter 40. Uh, this week there were multiple things in my study that I just had never seen before, uh, things that I found to be just beautiful and encouraging, and I'm eager to, to share those with you guys. When you think of the word comfort, I wonder what comes to mind. Maybe there's a particular person who's been very comforting to you in your life. Maybe your mom or your grandma was super comforting. Uh, maybe you think of a particular place, childhood home or a recliner or uh, the, the cabin up north, uh, just a place where you go for comfort. A lot of people find big old church buildings comforting, even if they're not Christians. There's something about some majestic old buildings you walk into, and it, it brings comfort to people. When you think of comfort, I would be surprised if you thought of the wilderness. Wilderness is not comfortable. It's wild, it is untamed, it is dangerous, it is potentially deadly. I like being in wild places, partly for the the risk and the excitement of it. I remember a few years ago being at the bottom of a, a canyon in Kentucky and uh, you know, realizing that my, my ankle that had been bothering me for a long time was not as strong as I thought it was, and uh, there's no way for me to call for help if I twisted it at the bottom of this canyon. There's no cell service. There's nobody around for miles and miles. And uh, for some of you think that sounds terrible. Others of you are thinking, yeah, that's great. Like, risk that's how it's supposed to be, right? Well, even if you love spending time out in wild places, uh, you know that there's not a lot of comfort to be found. The wilder the place, the less likely you are to be there in comfort. Even if you bring all kinds of fancy new gear with you, uh, the more comfort gear you bring, the less comfortable you are comfortable you are carrying it out to that wild place. Comfort and wilderness don't go together. So imagine how surprised the people of Israel would have been when Isaiah the prophet that we're going to look at today declares comfort coming from the wilderness to them. We don't have a lot of wilderness around here. You'd have to get all the way up to the UP to find anything that comes close to the wilderness. But if you went out to the western states, the mountain and desert states, you could find lots and lots of wilderness. But even that is not, there's not a lot of true wilderness left in the lower 48. The people of Israel had a long story, a long history that took them in and out of wilderness. I think about Adam and Eve, our first parents, cast out of the garden into an entire world of wilderness. Nothing tamed, nothing civilized, full wilderness. Abraham traveling for months in obedience to God's call, months through mostly empty places. 
Moses lived for 40 years in the wilderness as a shepherd of regular sheep, and then for 40 more years in the wilderness as a shepherd of the people of Israel. King David fled to the wilderness multiple times as his son and others tried to kill him. Prophets like Elijah and Elisha spent lots of time in the wilderness. And yet, the people of Israel would have been utterly flabbergasted at Isaiah's proclamation of comfort coming from the wilderness. We've got to do a little bit of history to get us up to speed for this week and for the next couple weeks. So put your history hat on. We're going to talk about the Babylonian exile. So Isaiah was a prophet during the time in Israel's history called the Babylonian exile. King David and his son Solomon had held the kingdom together, but then after that, the kingdom split into a northern kingdom, which called Israel, and a southern kingdom, which called Judah. Israel rebelled early and often against God. And God sent a series of prophets to warn them, if you guys don't turn around, if you guys don't walk with me, judgment is coming. And after warning, after warning, after warning, God finally sent uh, a punishment to them, the, the empire of the Assyrians. You can see on the, the map here, Nineveh, the capital city of the Assyrian empire, the Armies expanded out rapidly, taking over most of the Middle East or what we might call the Fertile Crescent or Mesopotamia. They came to the northern tribes of Israel and they, they just nearly utterly destroyed them. Killed many, carted off a few, just leveled the place. This map here would represent what the world looked like in 740 B.C., which is when Isaiah is writing what we're going to look at today. Now, the southern kingdom, Judah, they were more faithful for a longer period of time, but they also rebelled. God sent prophets to them to warn them, saying, look, you saw what happened to your your northern brothers and sisters. The same thing is going to happen to you. And after a series of years and a bunch of warnings, God used the empire of Babylon, the Babylonian empire, superseded the Assyrian Empire. If we go to the, yeah, the next, that's good, that sign there. Uh, The Babylonian Empire took over much of the Assyrian Empire. They came, they sacked Judah, and over a period of many years, conquered Judah and took off um, different groups of people in exile to Babylon. So characters like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the prophet Ezekiel that the guys are studying in Sunday school class right now. These guys are carried off from Judah to Babylon in that period of time called the Babylonian exile, which lasted for 70 years. Now, Isaiah, the prophet that we're reading from today, he's a prophet in the 700s BC, but he's prophesying about things that are going to come later. He gives 39 chapters of warning to the people of Judah. At the end of that 39 chapters, we read about how the end is going to come. So King Hezekiah of Judah, um, he thought things were going great for him. He had a bunch of official visitors come from Babylon, and in his pride, he showed them all of the wealth of the palace, took him through all the rooms, showed him all all the beautiful things that he had collected as a king, not realizing that they're scouting it out to come destroy him and steal all his stuff. And so the end of chapter 39 in Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah is sent to King Hezekiah to confront him. And this is the last of the warning section of Isaiah. So if you turn to Isaiah 39, 5 through 8, this is how it went. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and that which your fathers have stored up to this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. Some of your own sons who will come from you, whom you will father, shall be taken away, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Then Hezekiah said to Isaiah, the word, of the, Lord, the word of the Lord that you have spoken is good. For he thought, 
There will be peace and security in my days. What a loser, right? Like, things are going to be good while I'm alive. It's, it's really going to stink for my kids and my grandkids, but I'll be gone, so it doesn't matter. Right? We rightly look at leadership like that with a moral disgust. Right? If you're starting to put some things together and you're thinking, okay, so we have multiple generations that have been basically spending so much more than we can afford in this country, saddling our future generations with debt that will crush him. If you think there's a parallel there, then you're paying attention, right? This is selfishness of one generation, this particular one guy, saying, at least it's good for me. Life's terrible for my kids and grandkids, but I'll be gone, so it doesn't matter. That's how these 39 chapters of warning end. Now, the sack of Jerusalem, the capital of Judea, doesn't happen right then. It's still years away. It's after Hezekiah is gone, that the last are taken off to Babylon. But even though the things have not happened yet, when we turn the page to chapter 40, Isaiah is going to make a radical shift, and he's going to still be talking about things yet to come in the far future, but they're going to be good things. So the The exile hasn't all happened yet, and yet in 40, God's going to start speaking through Isaiah about the rescue and the return of the exiles. So, in Isaiah 40, 1 through 11, it starts with this, comfort. The first word is comfort. 39 chapters of woe to you turn around, you miserable sinners, or I'm going to destroy you. And then 180 degrees, comfort. Now remember, Isaiah's not just making this stuff up. He's a prophet of God. God is speaking through him. He says, he says to Isaiah, Isaiah, go tell the people this. And Isaiah has to do it. Now I'm imagining that even if he wasn't wired as kind of a hard man, that after 39 chapters of hard messages, his heart would have been hard. Like he's big on telling the truth. He's not so big on doing it with love. And God has to say to him, go comfort my people. What a hard change that must have been for him. Comfort. Comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Isaiah has to go speak tenderly to Jerusalem, capital city of Judea, and tell them that the warfare is ended. What warfare? Remember, this is all being proclaimed years before the things would actually happen. So you've got the warfare of the siege of Jerusalem still out in the future. You've got them carried off to Babylon still out in the future. And now he's going to be talking about their return from exile still way out in the future. But when these things come to pass, the battle for Jerusalem, for Judea, the, the battles against the Babylonians, all that stuff will have been long ago. So what is this warfare that suddenly ends with this turning in chapter 40? I think he's getting at that the people of Judah are at war with God. We'll see this very clearly as we go through a few more verses, but maybe this feels odd to you. Like, these are God's chosen people, right? How could they be at war with God? Would God consider people his enemy anyway? He's made all of us. He tells us he loves all of us. Would he use such language about the relationship between his chosen people and him? And if we flip to the New Testament, to the book of Romans, chapter 5, 6 through 10, we get some clarity on this question. Romans 5, 6 through 10 says this, For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since, therefore, we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. 
For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. Now there's a lot in there, but I just wanted you to see the language. Paul, right on behalf of Christians, saying, uh, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were enemies of God, Christ reconciled us to God. Our natural state as fallen human beings is that we are enemies of God. And the amazing good news of the gospel is that Jesus has given himself to reconcile us to God the Father. We'll get to that more later. If we go back to Isaiah 40, 1 through 11, let me read it again, first couple verses. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. So right after the warfare is ended, we get this statement about her iniquity, that's another word for sin, is pardoned or forgiven. And so that, that shows us that this warfare really is war between God and his chosen people, the nation of Israel. But God has extended them pardon and forgiveness. Notice here that Jerusalem as a city is referred to as a she. That's not just the customary way of referring to a city. That is foreshadowing how the church in the New Testament is referred to as a she, as the bride of Christ. We're meant to see a parallel between here, the rebellious people of Judah extended pardon and forgiveness, and us as the church. We were, and still in many ways are, rebellious people, and yet we have been extended pardon and forgiveness. And then the, the last part of verse 2 there. She has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. This is, this is not a statement of revenge. This is not God saying, look, you guys have sinned against me, therefore I'm going to punish you double for it. I'm going, to, I'm going to pay you back double. That's not what he's saying. Because what they're receiving is mercy. They're receiving forgiveness. I think this is beautiful. I'm reminded of the song that we've sung here a few times. Our, our sins, there are many. His mercy is more. This is a declaration that God's mercy to Judah, foreshadowing his mercy to us, is twice. It is, it is double what their offense was. This is how God loves us. Now, if you're wondering, why are we talking about all this stuff? We're, we're a couple weeks or a few days to Christmas. Shouldn't we be talking about Christmas stuff, right? Well, the next verse is why we're talking about this for Christmas. Verse 3. A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Do you recognize that from the New Testament? These words spoken by Isaiah in the New Testament, they get claimed by John the Baptist as his calling to prepare the way for Jesus to come in his public ministry. Now imagine, imagine that you know very little about Jesus, Christianity, you know a little bit about the Christmas story. Maybe you went to, to church as a kid and you got, got some memories and some language floating around in your head and you decided, I would like to know what the Bible says about that first Christmas. Because Christmas is coming up and I, I, I got to believe it's more than just Santa and presents and candy canes. There must be something more to it. So you get your Bible and you know enough that you expect to find the Christmas story in the New Testament. So you you flip to the table of contents, you find out that Matthew is the first book of the New Testament. You turn to Matthew and you start reading, and you're like, what is this? This is a genealogy of this guy, had this guy, had this guy, had this guy, and you're like, forget it, that's not what I want. So you flip a little bit to the right, and you end up in Acts, and you realize you've gone past the 
life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. They're all talking about him in the, in the past tense. And so maybe you flip back a book to John and you start reading in John. And you know John starts out with this really poetic stuff. In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. And you're like, what is going on here? One of these books has to tell the Christmas story, right? Now, if you'd been patient in Matthew, you would have gotten to the Christmas story, but you weren't patient, so you left it. So you, you fl- okay, I'm going to go to the second book in the New Testament. You go to Mark, hoping to find the Christmas story, and Mark jumps right in with Jesus already as an adult. There's no Christmas story. But how does Mark start? Mark 1, 1 through 4. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's like the title for the section. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, you will, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John appeared, baptized in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. So Mark starts his gospel account by immediately pointing us back to the passage in Isaiah that we just read. And he fills us in. He says, those words that Isaiah was saying, those are fulfilled here in this guy named John. We know him as John the Baptist. He lived in the wilderness. He was kind of a rough guy. Um, But he had a ministry of basically calling the whole nation of Israel at that time to repentance or to turn away from their sin. He called them to come out to the wilderness and to be baptized underwater as a symbol of that repentance. Symbolizes the dying of their old life, the washing away of their sins. Now, they don't know anything about Jesus, the death of Jesus, resurrection of Jesus. They don't know anything about that yet. But this repentance is meant to get them ready for Jesus to show up. He does very quickly after this. John's calling He understands it through those words in Isaiah 40. And Mark points us immediately back to that. It is as though Isaiah 40 is the prequel to Mark 1. Or it's the closest thing we have to a Christmas story for Mark. It fills in the blanks of how did we get here? Why is this crazy guy John in the wilderness calling everybody out to be baptized and to repent of their sin? Now, if you are curious about baptism, let me invite you to pick up our new baptism information packet on the back table there, and it'll answer a bunch of questions for you. And uh, then if you've got more questions, please talk to me or, or one of the elders if you'd like to explore being baptized as a public declaration of your faith in Christ and as a picture of the death of your old life and being raised to your new life, then that will answer lots of your questions for you. Let's go back now to Isaiah 40. I know I've read this a bunch, but I'm going to read it again. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly tenderly to Jerusalem. Cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. So same wording as what Mark used when he quoted it there. This voice of comfort crying in and from the wilderness is talking about preparing the way for who? For the Lord. That idea of the Lord's way being prepared is present both in the original and then in the quote in Mark. God's way is being made straight in the desert. Now, God is not bound to time and space. You know, you can be wherever and whenever all the time. So it's not as though there's a literal need for a road in the desert for God to walk along. This preparing the way we now understand is John's call to the people to repent, to be turning from their sinful lives in order to prepare them for what is coming in Jesus. If the gospel is pretty new to you, this idea of God having a way prepared for him might be new and strange. But if the gospel has taken deep root in you, 
I hope that this sounds familiar. Isaiah and Mark, John the Baptist, they don't say, prepare yourself a way and walk in it to get to your God. They say, prepare the way of the Lord. The Lord is coming to us. He's coming on a rescue mission. We cannot find a way, make a way, create a way to get to God. He comes to us. The gospel good news is the opposite of what we might expect. And and basically all other major religions in the world say a, a, a twisting, an opposite of this that's really similar to each other. All major religions basically say, look, there's a God or there's a bunch of gods and here are some rules, or here are some expectations, and if you're good enough, if you offer enough sacrifices, if you read enough holy books, if you, you know, what, whatever it is for that particular religion, if you perform well enough, maybe someday you can get to be with the God or the gods that that religion proclaims. You know, Christianity proclaims something completely different. We're hopeless. We have no hope of getting to God. There's no way for us to do it on our own, but God comes to us. The same God who was bringing all that judgment of those first 39 chapters of Isaiah is the God who turns and comes to his people in mercy and in rescue. Let's go down to verse 4 of Isaiah. Every valley shall be lifted up, every mountain and hill be made low, The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough a plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So now we have to come to the conclusion that this is not just talking about the first coming of Jesus. Because Jesus comes as a baby, which we celebrate at Christmas. Very few people know anything about it at the time that it's happening. It does not fit this where it says that the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together, this must be speaking of the second coming of Jesus. Now, for the last few weeks, we've been singing a song, How Long, O Lord, which gets part of its lyrics from this, Every valley shall be lifted high. It's translated right into that song, talking about the second coming of Jesus. Verse 6 then, A voice says, Cry! And I said, What shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God, word of our God, will stand forever. Now this is a classic biblical way of speaking of the temporary nature, the short-lived reality of our human lives. God is eternal. He's got no beginning. He's got no end. Even the longest-lived humans are, are just a, a blip on the timeline for God. Currently, as far as we know, the oldest person in the world is Maria Morera. She was born in California, but she lives in Spain. She is 116 years old, born in 1907. So she lived through both world wars. Spanish flu epidemic, and then finally COVID. And yet her long life is like grass that withers or a flower that fades. Now, when God says this, he's, you know, he's not beating up on us. He's, he's not insulting us. In fact, he's comparing us to beautiful flowers, right? But those flowers fade quickly. Even if you live as long as Maria Morera. It's really nothing compared to God. God is completely different. He lives forever. He is eternal. And what's more, this verse tells us that his word is eternal. Verse 8, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. That includes what we're reading this morning. They, these words in Isaiah will stand forever. Wouldn't it make sense to build your life on something like that? Verse 9 then. Go on up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift up 
Fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. Jerusalem, the capital city of the lower kingdom, the southern kingdom of Judah, is here referred to as Zion. So the the city of Jerusalem um, expanded out and was built on basically three hills. And so uh, we've We've got, uh, we've got some pictures that we're going to show you. If we'll go to the, the next one there. There we go. So this is, this is modern-day Mount Zion, one of the three hills. All right. If we go to the, the next picture, we get a map. So we start all the way over on the right side. The, the Mount of Olives, which is where the Garden of Gethsemane was and is. It's where Jesus prayed on the, the night of his arrest and trial. And then there's this big valley, and then there's the, the hill in the middle where the old city of David was. That's the lobe sticking way down there. And Mount Moriah at the top of that is where the temple, the Jewish temple was. Mount Moriah is often called the Temple Mount. Today, the Muslim mosque, the Dome of the Rock, sits on top of there. And then the last hill is what we call Mount Zion. And David built a fortress up there, but the city of David was actually back on the, the southern lobe there of Mount Moriah. Now, we have our own Mount Zion in the neighborhood here, right? So if we go back to the first picture of that set there, Greg, sorry, I'm going all out of order for you. Go back to the the one with the trees on it. All right, so this is our local Mount Zion. Not very impressive, right? Now, I love Mount Mount Zion Road is one of my favorite roads around here, right? It goes up and down a lot. It's got this tree canopy that closes in over it in a couple places, Um it's just a beautiful country road. And it traverses this not-so-impressive hill, which I guess somebody called Mount Zion. Now, that is appropriate, because the real, the original Mount Zion, is really not that impressive either. All right? So let's, let's go back to the, the picture there with the, the two labels. Greg, thanks for being patient with me. Right? So this is to give you an idea, this is what the city of Jerusalem looked like at the time that Isaiah is prophesying. All right? So you've got Mount Moriah with the Temple Mount on top, and you've got Mount Zion, and neither of them are giant mountains. I mean, you, they're called mountains, but they're just big hills, right? Mount Zion is not famous the world over because it is high and dramatic and imposing. It is famous the world over because God has called it special. It's about him. It's not about the hill. And we see that really clearly here if we read this section again. Verse 9, Go up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up. Fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. See, it's not about the hills. You go up on the hills, they proclaim... Behold your God. That's why we sang that song this morning. Behold, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his recompense before him. When Jesus came, and what we celebrate is Christmas, he didn't come in might, like is talked about here. When he comes again, he will come in might. And we get a hint of that here with this idea of the arm of the Lord. Almost universally in the Old Testament, when it talks about the arm of the Lord, it's talking about a a strength in judgment and punishment. The arm of the Lord is meant to be feared in most cases in the Old Testament. We've, we've got 39 chapters in Isaiah of the arm of the Lord is coming to judge. But we're making a transition here. And so the last verse in Isaiah 40, 1 through 11, that we're looking at today says this. He, speaking of the Lord, will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. What a change. So the the arm of the Lord that comes in judgment is now the arms of the shepherd 
holding the lamb. So a a little more history in a virtual field trip. This next picture is uh, the second oldest, as far as we can tell, visual representation of Jesus. So it's, it's dated at 250 AD, and it's found on the ceiling of a catacomb underneath the city of Rome. Now, Jesus here is represented basically like you would expect a Roman person of the third century to look. Um, but the, the striking thing is that he's, he's carrying this lamb on his shoulders. I don't know how well you can see. There's another lamb down on the right there, and then there's a chicken for some reason over there on the left. Yeah. But it's Jesus with the lamb and uh, a chamber pot, maybe. But this is painted on the ceiling of, uh, of a catacomb for a rich guy named Calixtus. 250 A.D. Of all the things that he could have had painted in the center of the ceiling of his catacomb, he chose a picture of Jesus in his role as the good shepherd. Right? So it could have been Jesus on the cross, could have been Jesus rising from the dead, Jesus calming the storm, all kinds of things. But he chose Jesus as what we recognize, Jesus as the good shepherd. Shepherd. Now that's the second oldest representation of Jesus, as far as we know, that we have. The oldest one is from just 15 years before that, 235 AD, in the city of Dura Europus, which if we go to the map in the next picture, you'll see it's near the border of what is today Iraq and Syria. The city was built about 300 years before Christ on a bluff overlooking the Euphrates River. So if we go to the next picture, you'll see what it looks like from space. You got old city ruins over there on the left side, then the bluff drops off, and then it's the fertile valley of the Euphrates River there. The city was destroyed in 256 AD, and the way that it was destroyed, it actually preserved a bunch of houses and buildings in one section of the city. They got they got covered in sand, basically. And so as archaeologists dug through it, what they found was stuff that hadn't been disturbed for almost 2,000 years. And what they discovered, this is a picture of the outside of it, is what they consider the, the oldest church building in existence. It was a house, but it was converted to primarily be used as a church building. Now, inside of that, there's a room dedicated for baptisms. So there's a, there's a baptismal tub. This is not actually the room. This is a a re- recreation of it somewhere, but it gives you an idea of, of what it looked like. It was a lot dirtier when they dug it out. There's this baptismal tub for, for Duncan people, and then in the arch there behind it is this mural, uh, artwork like drawn on the rock. And, and it's very interesting what's on that archway mural there, but first we're going to talk about what's on the right side of the wall there. If you look on the right side, there's there's a mural, and we'll go to the next slide here, of the women coming to the tomb on Easter morning. All right, so we've got the sun there representing the morning. They're holding um, torches because they're on their way to the tomb. So you've got Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of Jesus, the other Mary, lots of Marys involved. They're, they're going to the, the tomb on Sunday morning, and they've not yet discovered that it's empty. That's the, the scene that's there. But if we, if we zoom in on that first Mary there, we come to the striking conclusion that Princess Leia was at the, the tomb on Easter morning, which I'd, n- I'd never known that before. All right, let's keep the lights off because the next couple are going to be hard to see. Um, so if we go to the next slide, Greg, th- this is uh, the actual arch cut out of that, all right? And it resides at the Yale University Museum of Art. All right? So they cut it out, they took it there. And um, if we zoom in on it, we'll see this is what we believe the oldest visual depiction of Jesus. Now, I'm struck by a few things. First of all, this is like the centerpiece of the room. It's in the archway above the baptismal and it looks like a little kid's drawing, right? It's barely more than a stick figure. But it clearly represents Jesus as the good shepherd. Now we're talking 
almost 2,000 miles apart. Very different cultures, different languages, and the two oldest visual representations we have of Jesus are the good shepherd carrying a sheep, in this case a very large sheep, on his shoulders. Now, immediately to the right of that, still on the same rock, is another picture. And this is, this is harder to see. That's why the lights are off. So this is a, a small flock of sheep with one sheep going off on his own. And this is meant to represent the parable of the lost sheep. All right? So you've got on this rock, above the baptismal, parable of the lost sheep, and then Jesus as the good shepherd rescuing the lost sheep right above the place where the new converts, newly rescued by Jesus, are dunked under the water. So let's bring the lights back up, and let's quickly read the parable of the lost sheep. Luke 15, 1 through 7. Remember, Isaiah 40, 11 describes the Lord as shepherd enfolding his sheep in his gentle arms. Luke 15, 1 through 7. Now, the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him, to hear Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes, the religious guys, they grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, He lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. He comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. And you've got to see Jesus wink when he says that, because there's no ninety-nine righteous people that don't need repentance. Jesus is the shepherd who goes after the lost sheep. In the parable, Jesus is the shepherd. We are the lost sheep. We've wandered off. We're in the wilderness. We can't find our way home. We're helpless, defenseless, hungry, thirsty, scared. Jesus comes to rescue us. How does he do that? Well, it starts with the prophet proclaiming, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight the paths of the Lord, a highway in the desert for our God. Why did Jesus come as a baby that we celebrate at Christmas? Well, it's to be one of us, fully God, fully human. He grew like us, he lived like us, he was tempted like us, he rejoiced like us, suffered like us, he became a man, all of this without sinning like we do. God in the flesh lived a perfect, pure, holy life, and we think, of course he did. He's God, right? Now, those are all parts or aspects of this divine rescue mission. But Jesus could have done all of those things, even the ministry of miracles and the teaching and all that he did. He could have done all of that stuff, and we would still be utterly lost and hopeless. The main point of his rescue mission is to give up his life to rescue us. Christmas, the incarnation, amazing, splits time in half, doesn't mean anything without Jesus giving his life for us. And so keeping with this idea of of a shepherd, God is a shepherd caring for us, The main idea of Jesus' rescue mission is him dying. Read what John tells us Jesus said. John John 10, 11. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Now, notice, Jesus doesn't say, I'm a good shepherd. Like, there's a bunch of generally good shepherds doing generally good shepherdy things. No. He is the shepherd. Good shepherd. What separates the good shepherd from all the regular goodish shepherds? The defining characteristic of the good shepherd is that he lays down his life for the sheep. 
So it's not just that he goes out in the wilderness, puts him on his shoulders and come back and rejoices. But that God comes as a baby, lives in this sin-filled wilderness of our world, grows to be a man who gives his life. The shepherd lays down his life to rescue the rebellious sheep. And that's, that's really the point of this Christmas thing. It gets us to the shepherd laying down his life for his sheep. So here's what I want you to understand today. Isaiah, 740 years before the birth of Jesus, prophesied about the preparing of the way of the Lord. John the Baptist fulfilled that prophecy, calling the people of Israel to repentance, just as Jesus is coming on the scene. The Lord would come to his people in Jesus the Christ. He would travel on that prepared way from John the Baptist. He would live as one of us, and he would lay down his life to die for us. This way that was made for us, made the way for us to come to the Lord. Because he came to us. Isaiah 40 is the prophecy that forms or makes possible the Christmas story that Mark just leaves out 800 years later. The gospel, I'm sorry, the God who called the prophet to prepare the way is the God who came on the way to be the way so that we could have a way to be rescued by him. And there is no other way. The God of Isaiah came as the baby of Christmas and grew to be the good shepherd who laid down his life for his wayward sheep. And he is named the name that is above all other names as Jesus, the Messiah, the Rescuer. Lord, I pray that you would help us to, to know that these things are true. Uh, they're not just ideas floating out there in some ancient book, but they're grounded in reality. We have dates, we have locations, we have artwork. Lord, these things took place. You spoke through Isaiah. You spoke through John the Baptist. You came as Jesus the Christ. You gave yourself to rescue your wayward sheep. So this morning, as we prepare for Christmas in a few days, we, we sing together the name of Jesus, the name that is above all other names. And we thank you for, for this crazy, multi-century, multi-millennia story that all revolves around the baby who was the God-man, who grew to be the shepherd, who gave up his life for his sheep. In that mighty name of Jesus, amen.